This is the H3X Podcast with your hosts Mark Gearing and Dave Miller. Today we're joined by Bud Houston, Will Smith, and Kyle Pearson as we kick off the discussion on tools of the five T's in training strategy coordinators. We talk a lot about the clear path and simple tools. So what do we do on Monday morning as a laborer trying to advance the kingdom of God? And when we think about tools, the first thing that should pop into your head is the four fields, uh, which is essentially that toolbox. So how do we, where do we go? What do we say, right? What do we do when people say yes to Jesus? How do we gather people in the churches and, and reproduce the process? So in your four fields framework, if you want to see multiplication generationally and, and health go downstream, it's helpful to have two tools in each of those fields that you train broadly, that you continually campaign, and at least a foundational tool set that will get you going in the right direction. Those tools will change as you begin to talk to different types of people with different types of worldviews. But just having that simple tool set to get started, that's your basic, what do I do? And then as things begin to progress in the work, there's some other tools that are going to be helpful for you to develop leaders and get things moving as stuckages arise. But just knowing what are our basic tools? What do we do? Where do we go? What do we say? What do we do when people say yes or I'm interested? How do we gather people into church and help them have identity as church and grow to be healthy? How do we develop leaders to reproduce the process? So even though everyone listening may not understand the terms that you use, what are the two tools um, in the elevator pitch format that you're using right now with your team and the people you work with, Kyle? Just run us around the four fields on the tools you're using. Sure. So the first first field is the entry field or the question, where do I go? Who do I go to? And we want to point them to their spheres of influence. The first thing that we want to do is – show them that God has already give them, given them relationships. The world is broken up into two categories, saved and lost. And so we want to train our saved friends how to multiply and reproduce disciples. We want to share the gospel with our lost friends. So we make two lists in our spheres of influence. And then as we begin to exhaust our spheres of influence, so we're going to new people in new places. We want to find out where God is at work using the Luke 10 principle. So those are our two tools in that first field, spheres of influence and Luke 10. And then as we begin to see the hearts of people with our story, our 15 second testimony and a simple biblical and reproducing gospel tool in field two. So our story and God's story field two. And then in field three, as someone begins to show interest towards, uh, towards Jesus, and they say yes to Jesus, what's the first lesson that we want to give them? And that is the 411. A lot of people know and are familiar with the 411. Uh, that gets you going. And then uh, the other tool is our short-term discipleship tool set, which is a command of Christ uh, set using the three-thirds process. And then in field uh, four, um, I lied in field four, we only have one tool, which is the church circle. Uh, But a lot of teams have the left hand and right hand of church uh, formation and then church health. Uh, We stick with the church circle, Acts 2, 36 through 47. That has been a helpful tool for us to establish identity, but also maturity and health towards, towards healthy church. And then in the middle, is the leadership development toolbox. The first tool is the three thirds process. That's your, that's your engine to develop leaders uh, faithful to uh, hear, obey and share. And then the second tool is that model assist watch launch. So as we're moving people throughout the clear path with the simple tools, we want to model, we want to assist, we want to watch and we want to launch them. So that's our clear path. Well done. Put you on spot, Thanks. cast a little vision. Check mark, you win. <laughs> One of you guys want to jump in? What makes a good tool when we're talking about that? What is it that, that makes a tool worth our while? You know, I'll, I'll never forget learning this for the first time uh, when I stumbled into a training in Siliguri, India, 
and there was a room of, you know, a hundred Indian guys and, and the guy at the front of the room, as he was looking at the, at the four fields, uh, particularly on gospel, he asked them to do an exercise where they basically brainstormed all the different ways that they could think of to communicate the gospel message. And it was a fun exercise. I mean, there were a lot of different uh, ideas on there, as you can imagine. I mean, there were radio broadcasts and crusades, and there were all, all these different kinds of things and, you know, drama skits, all kinds of things. And, um, or handing out Bibles might be one, you know, and, and then the guy got up front and he says, well, well, let me ask you this. Like if you had one shot, to train a brand new believer on how to communicate the gospel, what are the qualities of a tool that would cause you to really narrow down our one or maybe two? And he gave a list and he said, you know, and we discussed, he said, now we'd want it to be biblical, correct? Sure. We'd want it to be biblical. We want it to be, we'd want it to be reproducible and, and, or, or affordable, you know, it wouldn't cost money, or cause a lot of, require a lot of extra resources. Everyone agreed on that. And as we looked at the four fields, we also agreed that we'd want it, we want it to be conducive to getting to the next step in the process. In this case, it would be discipleship, right? And then finally, is it actually effective? It may meet all those categories, but is it actually communicating the gospel in a way where people can receive it? And so with those four categories, they went back to their list and they, and they chose to, that they felt like met all those categories. So what happened there is we not only found an effective way to communicate the gospel, we found an effective way to create multiplying gospel communicators or seed sowers. And so that was a very, uh, very influential time. And it really affected me and my ability to train and really envisioned me for being a force multiplier. I'm really glad you shared that story. I just learned like five things out of that one story just now. (laughs) I'll never forget it. It was really powerful. So what's a, what's an example, a story one of you guys could tell about the ways in which you've seen that kind of that criteria, that biblical reproducing uh, tool that's really simple, easy for people to use um, one that, that can get you to the next step happen. Well, I'll, I'll take an example um, just right here where I'm living currently. Um, my uh, one of my son's football coaches uh, called me <clears throat> and said he wanted to have lunch. And so we sat down and had lunch together and turned out that he um, basically, long story short, he wanted to know how to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. I mean, that's what it came down to. And yeah, absolutely. So he did. He prayed to receive Christ and um and so uh, we were, I immediately began to explain to him about uh, the story of the woman at the well and about how she immediately went and told her story to others. And I, and I told him, I said, you know what, you have a story now of what your life was like before Christ, how you came to know Christ at this table right here during lunch. And then um, what your life has been like since you've known Christ, you know, now 10 minutes ago. And, uh, and, and now, and, and so I helped him learn to explain that. And when the waitress came over, uh, she, I said, you don't know this, but, uh, we're, we're celebrating here. Um, and my, and, and my friend has a story to share and, and actually put him up to that. And he actually, um, was able to describe what had happened during our lunch conversation about oh, it. Cool. He came in really how he wanted to know Christ how what I explained to him and what it's been like after he's like, I realize now I have a responsibility to tell other people what I've learned today. Um, And it just so happened. This woman was from Iraq, our waitress. And it was, and it was pretty, pretty neat. So immediately he was sharing the gospel uh, immediately and, and sat down and wrote down a list of his friends and family, you know, of people that he could go share with and, 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 and set up a rhythm for us to continue to be in touch so I could coach, to, uh, coach him and maybe problem solve and continue to give encouragement. But, um, you know, like the, the, the transferability of that tool just being easy, reproducible, um, and, and can be done immediately was just so powerful. And not only that, he went on to, to train his wife how to do it and, and his kids. So, um, yeah, that might be a good example of that. So it's a pretty good example. That would that would definitely be a good Facebook moment. We can share that one. We won't talk about all the other ones. It doesn't work that way, but that one was good. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we have a handful of those. Bud, when it comes to tools, somebody comes to you and they say, what's the big deal about being, you know, so clear on your tools or uh, being so, you know, set on, we're going to train these things. Why, why is that tool, the simplicity, the reproducibility, the biblical, why is it so important? Yeah, I think a, a couple things come to mind. So fir- first is having a tight tool set within your network or church is important because people often get confused and so I'll, I'll, I'll share just, uh, just go ahead and insert David, David often gets confused. Yeah. Yeah. D- Dave gets confused. So I'll, I'll just <laughs> kind of give a little, a little bit of a story. So I came to faith at age 26 and, and praise God that the church that I came to faith in was the pastor is faithful, uh, to share the gospel and train his church to share the gospel. And so within being a believer from a very young age, uh, I was 26, so not a young age, but as a young believer, uh, was was trained to share my faith. And the first tool I was trained in was not a tool. It was more of a process. It was, uh, I don't know what it's called. It's basically like share Jesus without freaking out or whatever. Yeah. And then like four months later, I got trained in another tool. And then four months later, I got trained in another tool. And it became this process where I, I was intermixing and getting confused and I knew the gospel and I could articulate the gospel, but I was, I was trying to use these tools that I've been, I had been equipped with, but it was getting confusing. And so from the context of a new believer or even going into a new segment of a person who's just new to the understanding of the gospel at all, having, having tightness and tools reduces frustration because that's ultimately what I was. I was confused, but my confusion caused frustration. And when we're frustrated, what do we do? We quit. Most of us quit. We give up. Yeah. Yeah. And so having a tightness in your tools is important because what happens is people get started. We overload them with tools and they quit. And they're like, man, they just fell away. And I really have to ask myself sometimes was, was, I part of that? Did, did I dump too much too soon? And I, and I think we have the propensity to do that as we, we get excited because we see someone obeying and it's like, oh, here's 18 more tools. You're killing it. Go get them. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it just gets confusing. So just saying, hey, here's, here's how we're going to enter. Here's how we're going to share the gospel and not being rigid in enforcement, but like, oh, you can't, you can't do that. But like, hey, what we train, what we talk about, what we practice together as a community or network, this is what we do. Because as people come in and come out, they're going to reproduce that. So not only can I, can I not function as an evangelist with all these tools that I don't necessarily understand, but there's no way I can reproduce that. You know, I, I, the phrase gets tossed around in our network a ton of confidence and competence, that um, those two ideas are pretty much the most important when it comes to getting people started. If I don't feel like what you're explaining, if I don't feel confident uh, on how to share the gospel, then I won't do it. If I don't feel competent on what to do, my confidence is not there and I'm just not going to share the gospel. Um, Oftentimes for us in our network, I mean, the primary way we're training people to share the gospel is still using the three circles. Um, And for us, the reason we use the three circles is because I can show it to somebody, they can see it once or twice, then they can go and fidget and fail. And after about four tries, they have the basics of the three circles down. Um, And it just doesn't take them very long to get competent in using you know, the super basic parts of it. But what I found is, and I love what you're saying, bud, what I found is, is that 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 competence in using the tool still won't get them to share the gospel out in the open. It's got to be something that we're going to take them to do like that repetition and using it over and over and over. And if we're changing all the time, that repetition doesn't happen. And so like, let's go back, Kyle, to what you had said earlier, right? Whenever we're talking about tools, you said you may transition them, right? You might actually adapt or you might change or you might adjust based upon the culture and those kind of things. Um, what, what's the principle? How would we explain to somebody that, that tension that Bud's saying, okay, we've got this tool. We want you to stick with it. We want you to learn it from the illustration of his life. We don't want to cause confusion, but at what point do we loosen up? Or what point do we start to ask the questions about 
what, whether or not we should adjust the tool or use something different. What's your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you start with best practices. So you start with whatever's working in that context. Uh, but if you start to hit barriers, then you want to start to tweak just a little bit, right? You want to start to tweak your tool, whether that be language or, um, you know, just a, a nuance and, and you don't want to tweak it that much. It's just a slight, slight change. Um, and you want to begin to see if that, if that works and you don't want to begin to train that tweak, right? You, you're just experimenting, right? And that may be some, some other location or some other place within your target. So this is experimenting with a tweak. Well, if you find a, if you find a tweak that's a, that's working, uh, then you want to try it a hundred times and see if it is, if this is truly, uh, now that's truly repetition, becoming, right. To be, <laughs> if it's truly becoming a best practice and, you know, if that's, if that's not working, you want to continue to uh, try new things in new places apart from what the network is doing. The, the worst thing that you could do is introduce a tweak that's not been proven to be a best practice and then, you get to where Bud was talking about, you get to paralysis and everybody's like, this doesn't work and I'm confused and right. what in the world. So you want to be very careful when you start to tweak things. And, you know, if, if things just are not working, you want to eventually innovate, but that is just the last resort. Most places in the United States, there are best practices already in place. Maybe a, among some people groups, there's not a best practice, but for the most part, there's, there's best practices. So you always, you always want to start with that, that simple, biblical, and proven to reproduce tools where you want to start. With. There's been tweaks, obviously, to the three circles. I mean, the original three circles that Scroggins created is not the three circles that most of us train. So, you know, there's, there's evidence of, of tweaking even in the, the No Place Left Network. 411 is a tweet of the why, whom, how, which was originally trained by Ian Kai. Right. So um, the, the danger in, in all that, and everybody wants to tweak and everybody wants to create their own tool. And, but uh, I would caution you in that. Find the best practice. Use that. And if you start to hit barriers, you start to hit, you know, uh, you start to see something not work or something not land, then start experimenting with tweaking just a little bit, but don't introduce that yet until it's proven to work. Right. Any last thoughts on tools, by the way, the uh, infamous Mark Gehring has now joined the group. What up, Mark? Hey guys. Great to see you. Mark. Sorry I'm late. No, you added, a, right. you added a couch. You added a couch. <laughs> we did. Yeah. It's all the same color now. Very too. Observant. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, great to see you guys. Yeah, oh, we're just I in the process say, of talking I love about what tools. Bud drew out. Oh, I'm sorry about it. I love what Bud said about just a standard kind of training set so that, you know, every time someone goes to a training, because we, we, and now we're kind of hitting on the connection between tools and training, aren't we? Uh, a little bit. But um, it, we have to understand as we learn tools, we need to to probably hear it, to build that confidence and competence to be trained and transition into the trainer at some point. Um, and with these tools to become truly competent, we know from adult learning that that the, the, the best way to really learn something is really when you start to, to teach it to other people. And I would also include modeling. So I think um, with Bud's example, just to be a specific scenario is not only what you train in a, in a group of several people, but also what you model in the harvest uh, where people are witnessing you. And it, and it really does take a great deal of restraint uh, to do that because we know a lot more than we're saying and to actually limit ourselves to a certain way of saying it. Like when I started gospel conversations, all my friends know when I'm modeling, I'm usually going to start it with something like this. I'm going to say, uh, hey, can I ask you a question? You know, if God could do a miracle in your life, what would that be? I'd love to pray for that right now. You know, and so that gives everyone in the in, that I'm modeling for confidence that I can I can use those words. I can say that. You know, 
instead of me thinking of some winsome, creative, door opening kind of technique, every single time I meet a new person, they're like, man, Will's really good at starting a conversation. No, Will's really good at sincerely desiring to know how I can pray for you. That's what right, we're good at. Right. Yeah, and we watched, I, and, and to your point, I've watched that happen over a nice Texas roadhouse steak where you guys <laughs> had the opportunity to really care for a waiter and then have a conversation afterwards. And uh, the time was right. The spirit had him ready and you and Kyle had the opportunity to lead him to Christ. I mean, it's just uh, us kind of tapping those waters to see what the Holy Spirit's up to. Now that Mark's joined in, I'm going to put him on the spot on the tool conversation, but how important has common language been do you think in terms of networks that you've been a part of? especially when it comes to tools and the people you've trained and, you know, poured into. Uh, yeah. So what I, I hear you guys mention in those uh, two C's of confidence and competence. And I think what tools have done in the networks that I've been a part of and seen is it builds that culture where somebody comes in and they're not sure what to do, but as they begin to see that everybody else is using that common tool, it gives them not only a place to start, but then it gives them language around which to uh, to talk and get better, and then also to kind of assess how are things going. So it kind of builds on that on itself. So starting out with tools, it's giving language and giving a place to start, but then it begins to make space for uh, problem solving down the road so that people can have common language around which to assess how are we doing. Uh, so it's really kind of a, a, a culture building piece, I would say. You know, I've been watching the Olympics. I don't know. I may be like one of, I think, maybe a half a million people that are actually tuning in apparently this year. But um, I've been watching the Olympics and the snowboarding. My wife bawled her eyes out when Sean White um, did his final run, especially whenever he didn't uh, finish it and he fell. But I was given there such a hard time where I'm like, every time a snowboarder goes down, they're like, look at the looky look double back 360 90 with the trouble head and flip over. Like, and I'm like, what are they? I don't even. It's like you get in the culture of that or skateboarding and they have all these terms for these jumps. And I just crack up at all the names that they give the tricks. And part of it is because I have no clue what they mean. You know what I mean? I'm not a part of that culture. I'm not a part of, you know, I snowboarded in the past, but basically the only trick I know how to do is face plant. Like that's the, that's the trick I know. Right. Um, but it's interesting that if you're in that culture, you know what those things mean. Um, you also have an allegiance to or a loyalty to or a, a, a commitment to the group. Like the language that we use and the ways in which we let people in and we teach them. And I think one of the things I, I as a youth pastor years and years and years ago, I'd always have parents come to me and they'd be like, you know, you need to clear out all the clicks. No clicks. Clicks are bad. And I used to say, no, clicks are actually a really good thing as long as those clicks stay open and are allowing new people to learn the language and they invite people in and they, you know, welcome people um, because it's like when there's a common language and, and Kyle, you smiled earlier when you said the 411 and all of us on the deal are like, Oh yeah, yeah. The 411. Well, a friend of mine on that same, I made some comment on a Facebook post about the snowboarding language. And he came back and he said, yeah, just like whenever you're in the no place left and you're dropping the 411 on somebody before they do full immersion baptism and then they go through the commands of Christ with the three thirds and make their fish goal or whatever, you know, like he used all of our language. And it's a guy named, uh, we call him the Maws in Oklahoma. He's a hoot, but he was poking at me. And I said, well, it looks like I've been converted to no place left culture, right? Um, there is an element, I think, where when you get to use the language that other people are using, it lets you know that you're one of us like you're in. And that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as the people who are one of us don't say to everyone, you can't be a part of us. Does that make sense? Like I, that, that common tool language has just been so helpful, I think, for us um, to where even in Oklahoma City, long story made short, we decided when we were training together across multiple different kind of networks that we would just, we picked the tool that we were going to train when we were together. And the person who was in charge of the training is the one that decided it. And we all just said, that's the tool we'll use, right? Because um, it was just helpful for culture and language and people feeling like they were a part. Yeah, I think every group does it. I think it's pretty unavoidable, but I think, I think you're right. I think the spirit in which it's done, if it's done with a desire for, it's like a verbal shorthand is what it is. 
it's like in a very concise way, I'm going to say something that if you if, if, if we have that common background of training, we know what we're talking about. But again, it goes back to that discipline and that restraint and that and that intentionality to be inviting into the community and to Bingo. be able to kind of tap the brakes on some of that and, and, and use the longer forms of those short words. And then also make it clear, say, hey, man, if anything is unclear to you, just don't, please don't hesitate to stop us. We'll explain it. I mean, we, we, we've developed some habits in our language, but right. the desire is just to, is to be efficient so we can move quickly to the, to, the, to the really critical topic at hand, I think. Have you guys ever been somewhere where you met somebody you've never known before and like within two minutes, you're like, oh, you're a no place lefter. <laughs> you just, boom, you just know. You're like, yeah. oh, you're, oh, I know. Do you know? Do you know? Yeah, yeah. And all of you like a lifelong friend instantaneously. Yeah. Yeah. What other thoughts do you guys have on tools before we move on to teaming? Yeah, I think just one one thing to connect uh, our target conversation. And if if a team has a specific segment target that their tools among that segment may be different than the broader network. And that needs to be okay, right? So like kind of nuancing, hey, as the network in a city that's going after no place left, here are our tools. But then, for example, in New York City, uh, there's people going after South Asian Hindus, people going after South Asian Muslims, people going after... Uh, West African Muslims. And so like there are, to Kyle's point, best practices among those people. And so then even whenever we were talking about going macro to micro among target, I think the same thing applies with our tools. Those one or two tools network wide are kind of macro for, for the whole geography. What is the best practice? And then moving to the micro, like, Hey, I, I may be using a different gospel tool. I may be using a different discipleship story set than another brother in my network who has a different target. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great point. It's almost like we've, uh, we've ran into friction over tools or something at some point in our life. <laughs> yeah. You think, <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, man, like I, I get the whole, hey, as a network, let's agree when we get in a room together to, to, to train, you know, perhaps a church or something like that. Let's get on the same page, you know, let's let's not cause confusion. Uh, but I think, you know, when it comes right down to it, you know, I, I've, you know, I've done lots of team building and I've had people come and say, hey, I know we train this as a team, but I really, really want to use this gospel tool. And that's just not a fight I'm willing to fight. You know, I'm just like, hey, here's the deal. You just do it abundantly. Do it a lot, you know, and really test it, you know, and be honest with yourself. Is it? And let's have dialogue about it. But thank you for respecting the fact that we're trying to have a broad training footprint and train a lot of people. We don't want to create confusion. But honestly, I'm going to celebrate abundance and faithfulness over like this hyper conformity to one tool as, as someone's actually in the harvest, you know, being a, a seed sower. So, yeah, I, I don't I think the conflict, we got to avoid conflict over this.